Um, uh, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Guy Newey. I'm head of uh, Environment and Energy at uh, Policy Exchange, and welcome to this uh, very well-timed event on uh, building low carbon uh, Britain. It's, uh, we thought it was going to be a good start to the new uh, political season anyway, and uh, it's certainly not likely to be an explosive season, uh, particularly in the energy and environment sector. Um, both sides of the coalition seem to be lining up to underline their, underline their differences on energy and environment during the conference season. While we've got EMR and the com various complexities inching its way through Parliament, um, big decisions on carbon intensity of the electricity system, guaranteed price for nuclear, um, what we do about shale gas, all these decisions have to be made in uh, what is becoming a fractious political environment and perhaps even more fractious after the reshuffles today. Um, so what effect does the day-to-day -day politicking have on the ability of the UK to attract low carbon investment, including international investment? Um, tonight we're going to try and explore some of those uh, issues. Um, our position, policy exchange's position on this is, is, is very clear. We think the government should be looking to make as few decisions as possible in the energy market but where they do need to be made they should be made as quickly as possible, which has not always been uh, evident in the last few months. Um, there should also be a, a very clear uh, focus on the cheapest possible decarbonisation and reducing the cost of new technologies. It's not just this for the sake of economic efficiency, but it's crucial to make it more likely that decarbonisation happens both in the UK and abroad, as well as protecting the, the most vulnerable consumers while we make that transition. Uh, the Prime Minister has stated that he thinks the UK is one of the best places for green investment, uh, including in the energy sector. Tonight we're going to test that, whether the current policy framework supports that claim. How well does it protect the interests of both investors and consumers? How well, well does it compare to regimes in other countries? And what improvements might be required? And we have the, the perfect panel to discuss these issues tonight. Uh, Laura Sands has been uh, MP for Southland since two, tw uh, 2010, since the last election, and sits on the Energy and Climate Change Committee. She's a tireless campaigner on environmental issues, ranging, ranging from food security to the green economy. Uh, crucially, she's also been working to increase environmental, the presence of environmental businesses and, and green skills in her own constituency, aiming to establish um, Southland as a, as a green hub. Um, Jeff Lockett, is the Global Asset Manager uh, for the energy businesses side of Air Products. Um, Air Products, I'm sure Jeff will talk about this, but for those who don't know, is a, a global supplier of industrial gases, chemicals, as well as environmental and energy systems. Um, they recently announced a, a $500 million investment in an advanced gasification uh, power plant in, in Teesside, so we'll have good insight into to how policy affected that investment decision. Um, a chemical engineer by training, Jeff joined Air Products in 1983 and um, is responsible for managing the global uh, energy business portfolio. He, as well as many other activities, he served as a member of uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's Hydrogen for Transportation Infrastructure Advisory Panel. Um, Alan Whitehead has been MP for Southampton Test since 1997. Um, a former leader of Southampton City Council, he's in an expert on energy policy and a, a fellow member of the Energy and Climate Change Select Committee. Um, this committee has been uh, pretty critical of the government's approach in, in recent months. I'd also highly recommend Alan's blog on energy, which manages to combine uh, detailed understanding of EMR with some good jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Not easy. Um, <laughs> Michael, Michael Lee Brack is Chief Executive of uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, um, a former Olympic skier uh, and a kind of serial entrepreneur. He founded what was then New Energy Finance in 2004 on his living room sofa. Um, five years later, he sold part of the company to Bloomberg for a lot of money. Um, uh, he sits on every advisory board known to the environmental movement. And uh, for those of you who don't know, he's a ferocious tweeter, taking swipes at uh, non-greens and indeed greens with uh, equal um, fervor. 
Um, I'm told we'll get the panelists to speak for about uh, seven or eight minutes each. I'll try and keep it to that, and then we'll have plenty of time for, for questions. I hope to finish up here about 7.45. For those of you who want to, who like doing a running commentary, the hashtag, if I can read it at the back, is hash lower carbon UK. Um, uh, but uh, I'm looking forward to what should be a, a very uh, strong discussion of, of the issues. Um, I'll ask Laura to speak first. Thank you very much, Guy. <laughs> thank you very much, Guy, and thank you very much for Policy Exchange for putting on this event, um, and also their products. Now, when I accepted this event, I didn't think that we were going to be the first item on the news on the uh, on news at 10 and I'm a little bit disappointed that we've got all this excitement going on across the road instead. But uh, I have been approached by a couple of people to say um, that obviously there's quite a lot of regret about Charles Hendry, who I think has uh, been a very, very effective minister yes. for, uh, for many years, I mean, both in opposition as well. And I know that I'm sure many of you will want to wish him the best in his future. We will be holding hands in the back benches together, so there we go. But anyway, um, I'm always very interested in the whole issue about being asked about the green economy and green investment. And you know, when we start to talk about the word green economy, green jobs, we actually start to set a whole level of sort of philosophical values around those policies. Um, you know, associated with the Green Party, associated with um, philosoph political philosophy. And I think that really it's a moment now where we can start and we need to sort of move a little bit beyond that level of, of branding, that level of identity, and start looking at what I would call a much more a vibrant in many ways, maybe more sort of kaleidoscope economy that actually reflects really what the renewal and the change in, in the energy sector and beyond in order that we actually do deliver a proper sort of low carbon Britain. Uh, my constituency, I've got uh, London Array and I had Thanet Wind Farm, so I had the largest wind farm in the world and now I have the largest wind farm in the world. And the jobs that I'm looking at around my area are not so-called green. Um, they're working at the sort of the cutting edge of energy sources, their vibration technology, um, surface engineering, that actually I was something that I was involved in in, in my previous life, uh, friction reduction. These are our so-called green revolutionary re revolution skills. But these people, they hold degrees in mechanical engineering, not in sustainability. And I think that we need to ensure that, firstly, as a wide energy and beyond that low carbon sector, we are not just politically and sometimes in the media classified as a sector that has this so-called philosophical not baggage because it's not necessarily negative, but that it gets compartmentalized into this is something, this is a, um, a, an option, this is a um, sort of charitable part of the economy. And I don't think anybody in this room would question how important the green economy is to this UK economy today. Not about the future, but today. And it is no sideshow, and it represents a significant part of the UK economy, and what we all know as a growing part of the economy. So we currently calculate that in an economy that we have very strong sort of presence from the Treasury, very concerned about growth, we can already say that in 2009-10, we were growing by 4.6% in the green economy. But we need also to be very persuasive about this particular sector, both from, certainly from a public policy point of view, and also from a, a, a consumer and industrial point of view. But if we only look at whether that be South Korea, China, other Asian countries, they're not overburdened with uh, Green Party candidates. But they're re-engineering their economy, not because it has some sort of political um, dimension, and not because it is seen as something that is good in, in itself. It is seen as something that is absolutely necessary. And I think that that is something that I think many of us feel that we have 
got that message across to governments over the, over the years. Maybe we need to start making that argument again. And if we've even got the, bank, the governor of the Bank of England who is saying that vulnerable economies are those that have extreme exposure to fossil fuels, and that we as an economy must look at it as a risk to our financial security, I think that we must be making these arguments again and again. But the green economy, and as you say, policy to attract green investment, of course, you're all here looking for government to have some of the answers. And government has an important role to play. But it won't be achieved just through a set of regulations or one act of parliament, however important electricity market reform is. To flourish, in my view, the green economy and a low-carbon Britain as a way of doing business and, and, and building an economy requires three elements. And I challenge, in many ways, the industry in particular, the energy industry, to understand the first element. And that is, we need smart consumers. We need smart businesses. And we need governments that have got real foresight and are consistent beyond, beyond one election to, to the next. Now, customers are actually pretty smart. And they're becoming much smarter, particularly as rising food prices, rising energy prices. They are reducing their energy consumption. Um, they will be exposed quite shortly to smart metering, which will be a new dimension, putting them more in control. But we have a challenge. Maybe business has a challenge. And that is that you've got to go out there and start, in many ways, selling green products in a much more exciting way, much more cutting edge, innovative, modern, about the future and selling to the consumer the options for their control over their energy consumption. Too much at the moment, and I, I sort of also brought this up a little bit today in our, one of our select committee meetings, too often the business sector, the energy sector in particular, treats the consumer as if, that they, as if they were Amrex. Um, the industry is geeky. The industry doesn't know how to enthuse and how to make that step change work. And I throw it out to you as there's a great professor called um, Saul Griffiths in California who is saying, make the sector exciting and sexy. Start engaging the consumer because the consumer is part of the answer to a low-carbon Britain. But while the majority of change, or quite a lot of the majority of change, will emanate from the private sector, government does have a very, very important role as not just policymaker, but also chief cheerleader in greening the UK's economy. It needs to back renewables, uh, substitutes, and re-engineering of our industrial processes. I mean, while I've never proposed that government chooses winners and losers, look at what government does in the defence sector. Through kinetic BAE systems, it tests products, it takes products um, to interim markets, it uses the R&D to actually test some of the greatest innovations that we have in that particular sector. So why are we not doing the same when it comes to, for example, property insulation? Uh, re-engineering how we, we process things. And I think the government does have a much stronger role to play in that. Also, government has to come clean. And every time I hear a, a, a minister, um, and also shadow ministers, stand up and say to the public, don't worry, we've got, we've got the, the silver bullet. Energy prices will come down. You know, and I know, and actually most of the public know that they're talking rubbish. We've got to be clear and clean and straightforward with the public that prices are only going in one direction and that what we need to help the public do is actually be more resilient to price increases and that consumption is the issue and how do we put in place measures and support to assist the consumer to manage price hikes. But if we hold out constantly this idea that prices are going to come down, the consumer will not 
change behaviour. The consumer will not adapt, will not be excited by new energy um, and, and sort of you know, energy efficiency products. But as everyone knows in this room, the key issue that government must also deliver is consistent and coherent policy framework in which existing operators in the renewable sector grow, but that really attracts new entrants with the element of policy certainty beyond the next election and into the future. Now, I'm sure Alan will also talk quite a lot about electricity market reform. The bill must deliver an act that does not complicate decision making. I'm very, been working very closely with the investment community, and I am concerned that the bill as it currently stands creates the opportunity for financial gaming, that creates complexity that actually excludes smaller operators from investing, that actually creates barriers um, to new innovations. We certainly made this clear in our uh, select committee report. We need to simplify the current complexity and the complex layers of incentives. We need to deliver an effective capacity mechanism. We need to look at the whole issue about storage and in many ways hedging the, the, the pricing situation um, globally. And I would like to see something further and that is um, for us to look at how into the future we can start to decouple uh, renewable energy prices to globally traded prices. Government is also promising us demand reduction measures that were disappointingly left out of the draft bill. Um, because as we all know, carbon is the symptom, consumption is the problem. But ultimately, if we get the policy right, the barometer of success, not next year, not the year after, maybe in 10 years, will be that we will no longer discuss the green economy. We will drop the word renewable because renewable will be the norm. And instead, we will start using the term fossil. And fossil will be the explicit term. There will be widespread recognition that it's as much about energy, economic efficiencies and resilience and the modern economic model as it is about decarbonisation in the face of climate change. There is a total convergence in all our minds on what is good for business is also extremely good for the environment. <coughs> Exciting and sexy. <laughs> Jeff, how's <laughs> you? Uh, thank you. Uh, all I can say it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is a very exciting event for me to actually be a part of, so thank you for that. Uh, Guy actually did a very good job in introducing me. Uh, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm an American. <laughs> and I work for Air Products, which is an American company. But here we are in England talking about a pretty exciting project that Air Products is undertaking. And this isn't new to Air Products. Air Products has a pretty big presence in the energy and renewable energy markets. Uh, we operate natural gas combined cycle power plants in parts of the world. We operate biomass plants. We have a solar uh, facility. And we've operated energy from waste uh, facilities in the past. And uh, we'll talk a little bit later about our Tees Valley Renewable Energy Facility that uh, we've recently announced. Um, one thing that Guy left out when he introduced me was uh, the fact that, and he made reference to it, uh, prior to taking my current role in the energy business, I actually managed the Airbox hydrogen business in California. Most of you probably know, California prides itself in being on the leading edge of environmental issues. And for the eight years that I was in California, I actually got to witness the policy and uh, legislative framework around California's carbon and greenhouse gas reduction uh, legislation. <coughs> that was quite the massive undertaking. Um, and I got the opportunity to see firsthand how the government went through that process and how it affected industry and industry's decision to invest and make uh, decisions regarding their operations long term. So I'll come back to that a little bit as it 
relates to what we're going to talk about tonight. But uh, we've mentioned our uh, Tees Valley Renewable Energy Project. Um, very, very interesting project. Uh, basically what we intend to do there is take unrecyclable waste. That's material that was going to end up in a landfill somewhere and convert it into electrical power. You know, enough power to uh, keep the lights on in the equivalent of 5, 50,000 homes. Um, the process is going to use an advanced gasification technology, which is very well described in some of these banners that are up here. And we believe that that process is going to result in a power facility that's got better efficiency, lower emissions, and is going to provide um, base load, non-intermittent power uh, as cost effectively as, uh, say, uh, other technologies like offshore wind. So it's uh, very exciting. But interestingly, uh, it was a project that almost didn't happen. Um, you know, Air Products invests billions of dollars a year around the world. And in a project like this, when we kick off the development effort, we start to look globally for a site that would be amenable for this type of investment. And I think it kind of surprised all of us that we found an amenable market here in the UK for this facility. And like a lot of new technologies, and particularly a technology that's competing in a market that's already dominated by well-established facilities using fossil fuels, this project was going to need some kind of support to move ahead. And we found it here in the Renewable Obligation Legislation. Now, one of the things that caused us some distress as an investor was the delay in that legislation being finalized. We had actually made the decision based on a certain timeline to kick off the project, and there were continuous delays in that legislation being rolled out that caused untold concern within our company back in North America. So that's another example of how government action can affect an investment decision. Now the good news is, this isn't the first facility we're intending to build. Our goal is to build another four of these facilities over the next 10 years. Now, we firmly believe, and the only reason we're doing this is that in the future, this, this technology is going to stand on its own. And we firmly believe that as the technology matures, as we reduce our costs, and as the real cost of kind of maintaining a business as usual system is understood better, you'll find that these technologies do stand on their own. But we're not going to get to that point if we can't find a way to continue providing that support in these next stages of investment. Now I refer back to my California experience and try to think, what did California do as they were rolling out, you know, kind of, I'm not going to say it's the same, but it's comparable type legislation that created problems or actually thinks that they did very well. And the first is you have to create a confidence in the investing community that you're going to do what you said you're going to do. That timelines are going to be met, schedules are going to be met, and you know, kind of things like radical changes of ministers doesn't help. Um, that never happens here. No. And, there also, also has to be a certainty that once something's put in place, it's going to be there, and it's going to be there for the life of the project. Uh, we also like to see transparency in how the legislation process unfolds. It doesn't do anyone any good to have a feeling that there's some kind of backdoor political deals being cut that are favoring one technology over another. The other thing that we found was um, the more industry can be involved in the regulatory process, the less likely is there a chance for unintended consequences to be written into the legislation, which not only inhibit it, but actually work against investment. And then last but not least, and I think Laura mentioned is simplicity. You know, these are complicated projects to begin with, and you've got to explain to a lot of senior executives and a lot of board, you know, boards of directors what you're going to do and complexity does not make that easier. So um, again, this is a kind of an exciting experience for me. I'm looking forward to the rest of the speakers, and I'll be happy to answer any questions at the uh, appropriate time. Thank you.
takes out on the challenges, uh, transparency and simplicity, words that go hand in hand with uh, Tristan Market Reform. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, since I've um, been introduced uh, as someone who does um, put out a blog which occasionally has jokes in it as well as um, other things as well, I think I ought to just start off by announcing my latest uh, blog entry um, on um, levies and um, carbon taxes and the future of uh, electricity price rises. And I've headed it um, when the levy breaks. Um, <laughs> picture of Robert Plant underneath, which is a joke of only people over 45 <laughs> <laughs> with retro tendencies will really understand. <laughs> um, I also uh, thought I might uh, just to say something very briefly, I'm following Laura's comment um, about how sorry I am to see Charles Henry um, go as, uh, uh, as Energy Minister. And I don't really take this very personally as much as I have on frequent occasions uh, in the Energy and Climate Change Committee and elsewhere, um, as the vernacular says, beat him up. Um, and, um, uh, I'm, sure that's, I'm, sure that's, <laughs> I'm sure that's. I'm sure that single-handedly helped his demise, rather <laughs> well as um, opposition MP here this evening. Um, but I, uh, I, I, I do think that's a, a, a very um, sad uh, moment, in, particularly in terms of what is happening as well as AMR and Charles's role in that, and particularly the discussions going to the nuclear industry. Currently, um, and uh, that I think is, uh, is does present over and above um, the personal problems as far as Charles is concerned. I think difficulties for uh, the next period. We need a, a strong hand <coughs> as far as those um, arrangements are concerned. Uh, I think also we do need uh, a number of strong hands in terms of uh, the green economy. Uh, and green recovery and uh, indeed this afternoon uh, one of the things we did at uh, Energy and Climate Change Select Committee was, um, uh, I don't think it will be any, you know, a secret, um, decided uh, that we would um, on balance endorse uh, John Gummer as the uh, uh, new chair of the Climate Change Committee. I'm sure I left a terrible secret out by, by saying that Laura. Um, uh, but one of the things he said this afternoon in his, uh, in his interview from the front of the set committee was growth that is not green growth, he doesn't think now, he said, is not really growth. And I think we do have an imperative of ensuring that our recovery is a green recovery. And I think we have that imperative because we need not just recovery uh, by any means, but we need that future infrastructure, we need those future industries, we need those services, we need residential environments, we need transport for the future and investment in all of those areas that is by definition radically lower carbon than is the case now. And I think then we need to keep that on track uh, for carbon emission reductions which actually meet our uh, climate change targets and continue to do so. And it is interesting, as, uh, as, as Laura has mentioned, that actually that the beginnings of investment in the green economy is, is beginning to happen rather well. Uh, the economy, green economy growing, as, uh, as we mentioned, at 3% a year, while the brown economy continues to be in recession. And it's vital, therefore, that we keep that going, that we replace infrastructure in such a way that it actually points towards those, those climate change emission targets and not away from it. And if we do replace our infrastructure, if we do reinvest our economy in such a way that institutionalizes a high carbon future, then we will not have any chance of meeting those targets for the future. And I want to just concentrate for a moment on, on two of those particular areas, because I think they underline the challenge that's, that's ahead. Uh, we should be building low carbon new housing, but most of our housing stock that we have at the moment, some of the worst and least carbon uh, energy efficient housing stock in Europe will be around with us till 2050 at least. Most of the houses that are standing today will be there in 2050. At the moment they are leaking 
uh, energy uh, through the roofs and the walls as if there is no tomorrow in general. And therefore, uh, investing in not just new housing stock but a radical uh, retrofit of uh, the housing stock that there is now um, will be actually uh, a very substantial uh, green low carbon investment which will bring jobs, will bring um, long term benefits uh, in the process is one of those important, I think, parts of getting us uh, in, on the train to green recovery. And indeed, replacing our energy infrastructure to replace high carbon plants going out of commission with low carbon replacements. And at the same time, the grid systems we need, the smart grid systems, the substantial and sustainable energy efficiencies, energy use that we need. Estimates are that uh, the sort of scale of investment that is needed over the next uh, 20 years or so is going to be something like 200 billion not in replacing like for like, but replacing present and outdated energy plant, energy transmission, and, uh, and so on, uh, with those replacements that are low carbon and continue to be low carbon. Most of that investment will, of course, come from the private sector, but I think we have to recognize that we're in a different world in terms of green investment uh, goes, in as much as it's always a higher investment <coughs> risk than traditional investment. Um, energy efficiency, for example, as an asset is extremely difficult to place on the books. Uh, you have to actually deal with that uh, in different ways in terms of how you go about investing in it. That investment, I think, therefore needs, number one, certainty of investment climate and a, and a reasonable long-term guarantee of a fair return. Number two, underwriting and backup to develop, and number three, a longer term investment timetable than is currently seen as the norm. Now we have underway at the moment two um, pieces of legislation and initiatives which I think both of which will be crucial in those two areas. Now, firstly we have um, energy market reform, uh, which I think will actually be absolutely central in terms of setting seen for the next 10 to 15 years of our energy markets and our energy investments climate is absolutely vital we get that right and secondly in terms of that uh, radical uh, refurbishment program as far as homes uh, are concerned the the success of the green deal energy company obligation <coughs> associated activities is also very important and i have to say as both presently stand i don't think either of those has a serious hope of securing the sort of buying the future green investment in the way uh, that I suggested. <coughs> as far as energy market reform is concerned, I've said uh, previously uh, on, in other places, energy market reform actually is quite remarkable in as much as it's uh, energy market reform doesn't actually reform the energy market, um, <laughs> which I guess is a bit of a sort of crucial first hurdle to get over. But what it also uh, doesn't appear to do is create that climate of certainty for future investment that is going to be absolutely necessary in terms of low carbon energy economy. And it is indeed hideously complicated in the way that Laura has uh, described when we need simplicity uh, in future investment. We have got a programme of um, contracts for difference for uh, renewable energy, the end of the renewable obligation on March the 31st, 2017, halfway through uh, the roll out and deployment of round three offshore uh, wind uh, energy program. A period of desperate uncertainty when we absolutely need certainty for the next period of large scale, low carbon energy investment. And it's uncertain because indeed the renewable obligation is coming to an end. We don't know at the moment whether there's going to be a government counterparty for contracts for difference, whether there's going to be that sort of backup which will make that new system work. There is no obligation after 2017 as far as the purchase of low carbon energy is concerned. We don't know um, whether that investment will actually therefore work. And indeed, in terms of the deployment uh, of CFDs, we don't know how they are going to work uh, between years and whether indeed with the levy system back to my uh, starting point in this uh, speech in, in place, actually people will be able to book contracts for difference in a year when they actually want them to deploy. So a, a whole range of uncertainties introduced uh, at a moment when we absolutely need certainty and long-term uh, investment 
uh, clarity as far as those sort of large scale investments are concerned. And my concern is that actually we may end up with a dash, a new gas, dash for gas as a default mechanism, uh, just at the time when actually we need to really decarbonise our energy economy and thereby install infrastructure which simply will not allow us to reach our climate change uh, and uh, carbon emission targets over the next uh, few years. And I could move on to the um, uncertainty on nuclear investment on the uh, no public subsidy uh, question uh, and how exactly that is going to be resolved through electricity market reform, but I think we'll leave that discussion perhaps for another day. Green Deal, uh, I personally think, may well founder uh, not on the intention of Green Deal, not on a number of the aspects of Green Deal which are very positive, but simply on the idea that the interest rates for Green Deal will be too high to make it uh, workable uh, as, a, as a market instrument. And both of those instances, I think, underline in addition to the fact that uh, energy company obligation will undoubtedly be capped by that levy system, which will mean it will fall short of its target in terms of uh, attacking particularly hard to treat uh, homes over the next period. All of those, I think, are examples of the extent to which we need that simplicity, we need that long-term investment confidence, and we need the underwriting for those investments which will make them work over the period which don't appear to be present <coughs> at the moment. I think uh, we need to look seriously at that in terms of instruments such as uh, the Green Investment Bank uh, as a Green Investment Bank rather than the Green Investment Fund, uh, making the Green Investment Bank work now and not in 2018 uh, so that we actually have got that sort of um, uh, relatively low uh, cost of investment um, uh, uh, backup available. I do think it's essential that the government underwrites uh, contracts of difference in some way or another, otherwise we will not make progress with the electricity market reform. I do think we need to move much further forward on new forms of financing, such as green bonds, uh, in order to put that uh, long-term and uh, longer-term investment uh, capacity into the system. Uh, and finally, over the next period, we need no surprises. And that brings me back to today's announcement. I think that's what we don't need right now in our future energy economy. Not many jokes in the second part of what I have to say, <laughs> um, but I hope you'll take that in the spirit of this intent. Yeah, I think we're all hoping for a few more jokes. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. Uh, Michael. Thanks very much. Um, thank you. I don't know, now the pressure's on, I have to start with a joke. And uh, usually when uh, the Olympic skiing thing gets mentioned in the sort of preamble, um, there's, there's, there's everybody sort of sitting there thinking, hmm, I wonder if he won. It's like, well, excuse me, I was in the British team. <laughs> but, but, but I was the highest place management consultant. <laughs> so, at the time. So, um, what I thought I could do is perhaps give a little bit of the context, both um, from the investment point of view, which is where the money is coming from uh, and where it's going, and also some of the international context. Uh, what's happening around the world because uh, we're not doing this in a vacuum in fact we're doing this in competition and in cooperation uh, with those in other countries um, and that's something that at Bloomberg New Energy Finance we track all that investment activity uh, about uh, 35 out of 200 people sit in South Africa just entering data into data sets of financing so let me start there um, what we see is investment in clean energy and I, I I'm a bit uncomfortable with this business of a low carbon Britain because I don't know what one of those looks like, but I'll talk about energy and then broaden it perhaps. So clean energy, which is renewables, energy efficiency, the smart grid, power storage, uh, the things that are going to be uh, you know, the major constituent parts of a lower carbon energy system of the future. Uh, the investment level in that has risen from about 50 billion in 2004 to around 280 billion last year. And coincidentally, I started New Energy Finance, as was then, in 2004, so I take credit for most of that increase. <laughs> um, but 280 billion, quarter of a trillion, um, 
Over the last <coughs> six or seven years, we've logged a trillion dollars of investment in this sector. So there's a few um, subliminal messages already that should start to emerge that this is not small, and this is not marginal, and this is not something uh, that happens uh, at a national level. A trillion dollar investments worldwide, something, um, something big is, is on the move. And of course, part of that, a large part of that in the initial years was driven by policy. Uh, we tracked, uh, I think it was something like 1,800 different policy announcements worldwide, whether it's renewable energy, or whether it was energy efficiency, or whether it was climate and carbon related during the period 2004 through to and just after Copenhagen. Uh, and that clearly had a huge uh, role to play. Those were whether they were feed-in tariffs, or whether it was renewable obligations, renewable portfolio standards in the US, um, tax treatments, uh, all sorts of different, or cap and trade, different mechanisms. But what's been very interesting, as the air has gone out of those support mechanisms, whether it's because green stimulus um, initiatives have been dismantled, or whether it's because of European uh, fiscal problems, or in fact, uh, uh, pressures on, on uh, fiscal balances around the world, what's happened is that the costs of those technologies has been coming down almost in lockstep with the evaporation of the support mechanisms. So we've seen in the last three years a 75% reduction in solar photovoltaic costs to the point now where anywhere sunny in the world it either is cheaper to put solar on your roof than to buy from your utility or it will be within a few years. This is not theoretical. Uh, there are major projects in Turkey, in Spain, in the US, uh, in Mexico where organizations are looking to build solar photovoltaic large projects with no subsidies. Right? This is where we are now in that industry. Wind, the costs have also come down. They've come down 25% uh, in the last three years. Wind is now competitive. The, be the, the best wind farms, that's large wind farms, uh, which are in good windy locations where there's a good user of that energy, are now competitive with new coal. And they're competitive with natural gas, interestingly, at $6 per million uh, BTU. Now, the price in the US is currently lower than that, the price in Europe is higher, the price in Asia is considerably higher, but these are real figures based on data that we collect from our clients. And our clients are people who build these things. Right? So that's the true picture of the costs. Now, there are questions about uh, intermittency, there are questions about whether grids can accept all of that energy, but those are the basic data on the costs of these technologies. We see the costs of uh, lithium-ion batteries come down also by around 30% in the last two years. So currently electric vehicles on a total cost of ownership basis more expensive than uh, the gasoline or diesel equivalent, but the trends of these experience curves are inexorable. There's no limits. These are not resources that are in any way limited uh, or, or, um, uh, or deplete over time. And so it's pretty straightforward to model based on cumulative experience in these sectors what will happen with costs going forwards. And you go to 2020 and the cost of onshore wind will come down another 20% and the cost of offshore wind will come down probably 40 or 50% and the cost of solar will come down another 30 to 50% of photovoltaics and the cost of um, dealing with intermittency, whether you do that through uh, demand management, through software, whether you do it through linking to other networks, uh, whether you do it, um, it, 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 there are a number of different approaches to dealing with those intermittency issues, even just the yield itself of uh, these resources, those costs come down too over time. So what we're looking at is a complete transformation of the nature of our energy system. And it's not driven because of some support mechanism in Germany, and that's good. It's driven by the underlying economics of the sector. Now, this is not something that's going to happen tomorrow. 
The energy industry is the largest industry in the world. It's 10% of GDP. It's capital intensive. So these trends will take a long time to play out. And on a global basis, when I talk to uh, at the UN General Assembly, to those who are worried about it at that level, the real question is, will this happen in 70 years? Will this happen in 25 years? Until we're really in what we would all recognize as a new situation. Faster than 20, 25 years, inconceivable because of capital intensity and, and lock-in and, and so on. But that's where we're going, and we are driving to a much more resource efficient economy. If you put this, uh, you compare it to uh, the focus in the 70s and 80s, the constrained resource was educated labor, educated and skilled workforces. We're now in a resource constrained world, in a high resource price world. And so economic viability means uh, becoming resource efficient. Now, where does that leave the UK? So I'm postulating that this shift is an inevitable shift. It's inevitable for the health of the economy. And the question is, does the UK want to lag to try to maintain the old industries? Or does it want to lead, and if so, by how much? And that's effectively the question that faces the country. And it's a kind of man or mouse moment because half lagging and half leading doesn't do it. It doesn't provide the certainty for the sorts of projects that Jeff talked about in his remarks. And so I think that's, that's really what is needed is um, clearly, I believe, a decisive move of the sort that uh, Laura talked about towards the resource efficient, I don't want to call it low carbon, I call it a resource efficient economy and if you think about the nature and the structure of the UK's economy, we are ideally positioned. Now, I don't believe when the Prime Minister said we're the best place to invest, I think he was thinking about sort of the policy and the regulation. I look at it in terms of the microeconomics of sector after sector. We have nanotechnology, we have biotechnology, we have an automotive sector which is second to none in the world in terms of innovation, we have aerospace, we have IT uh, communications, we've got services, whether it's the City of London, whether it's uh, offshore uh, service for the offshore oil industry that's uh, developed enormous capabilities, um, whether it's the legal services, construction, engineering, just across the board, the UK ought to be one of the major winners of this inevitable transformation. But it doesn't sort of just happen. We actually have to think about it sector by sector and make it happen. And at the moment, I'm playing the big discussion around uh, the EMR and energy reform. Um, what we've got, if you actually look at where we are today and where we're likely to remain even after EMR, you know, we have a cap and trade system. You know, we like cap and trades, so we have one of them. We have, of course, it doesn't work, so then we have a carbon floor price. Uh, we have a CCS commercialization program. Uh, we like to, there should be taxes on bads, so therefore we've got climate change levy, we've got accelerated depreciation of energy efficiency, a carbon reduction commitment, we've got some feed-in tariffs, because we like them, heard they work pretty well in some places. Renewable obligation certificates, contracts for difference now under discussion capacity markets, green investment bank, because people aren't investing, so we need one of those. Uh, low carbon network fund, renewable heat obligation, biomass rules, biofuels rules, <laughs> NESTA, the technology strategy board, energy technologies. This is a midden. If you actually excavated it, this is a midden of semi failed policies. Right? And this is what makes it difficult to attract investment from overseas. The industrial base is absolutely second to none. But is this a place where it is simple and straightforward to get those decisions to explain to boards exactly what the returns will be to the extent possible in the uncertainty of commercial activity in order to come to the UK and invest? And I would argue we need to do quite a lot of straightening out and simplifying and, and calming down uh, in order to create that sort of environment that will attract uh, capital. But we certainly can do it. Uh, because the resources that we have at our disposal here are so strong. Thank you.
and thanks to the panel. Um, we've got about uh, half an hour for questions. Uh, I just ask that you identify where you're from and please keep the questions short because we want to try and get as many in as possible. There should be a microphone coming around. Yeah. Just I'm fixing it. <coughs> Bob Ward from the uh, Grantham Research Institute at LSE. Um, in many ways, the Treasury is currently the biggest obstacle to uh, low carbon growth in the UK. And I was wondering what the panel felt the prospects were of the Chancellor actually using his conference, his upcoming conference speech to uh, try and decrease rather than increase the policy risk for the low carbon sector. Laura, do you want to come back on that? Yes, I will. Um, I held a sort of backbench debate on, on the green economy six, seven weeks, well, just before recess. And actually, the response was, was pretty positive from the Treasury. I think, again, I come back to this issue, and I, I will be very much pushing them, as will other, other, other members of Parliament. Um, when we started to look at the support, particularly on the Conservative side, it was pretty widespread that companies within constituents are actually part of this green economy and I think that we're trying to ensure that they are what I call flushed out, that there is an absolute understanding between economic growth and the green economy. But the Treasury in particular, it's not in some ways so much the Ministers, it is the Treasury's sort of psyche. Is there anybody here from the Treasury? <laughs> um, the Treasury's psyche. Um, but exactly, they're not saying anything. <laughs> We will find you. Um, no, is, is that um, it's a little bit all tied up in this branding issue because the green economy is not seen as an efficient economy. It's not seen as an effective economy. It is seen as something that is a sort of um, you know a charitable sector, and that's where we collectively, politically, but also very much from a business perspective, needs to pick up exactly what Michael's saying. Is the, this is about having a modern, cutting edge, innovative you know, leadership economy. And we start to get more of those messages over and confront the Treasury on that, I think that we can get much further. Michael, in Westminster Village, we talk about, you know, whether the Treasury is a help or hindrance. So international investors, you know, do you get the sense that international care about this stuff, or is it, do, does that resonate? Uh, I think it does, and I think you might be, we might be surprised, because actually the sort of clarity of purpose on the Treasury is a huge asset. And the fact that the UK, more than so many other countries, has decided to tackle the deficit, um, you know, that, here that becomes oh, just another uh, another chip in the political game to, to play to and fro. But actually, um, if you're a large-scale investor, you actually quite like investing in countries that um, that don't retroactively change tariffs. And I don't think that anybody would suggest that our Treasury is going to do that sort of thing. Um, and also, ones that have got their deficits under control or en route to being under control. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't underestimate that, in a sense, that's part of our branding as well. But I want to say, I want to echo what Laura says, You've, this sector has just done a horrible job, even things like a low carbon yes, you know, What you need to talk to, there's a false dichotomy. If this is about tax take, this is about exports, this is about growth, this is about resource efficiency, what part of that is the Treasury supposed to object to? But the industry tends to spend much too much time, I hate to say it, trying to uh, please all, you know, please too many people, and frankly, to have the begging bowl, bowl out for far too long in solutions that are, you know, not the optimal ones for, for this country. Jeff, do you recognise that criticism that the, the begging bowl's out too often? I said something interesting. <laughs> <laughs> no, and in fact, I, I thought the question was interesting because as an American, you guys seem to get along pretty well. We're polite, that's it. So, uh, yeah, I think as an outsider looking in, we aren't going to get wrapped up in the in individual or internal squabbles. We want to see the finished product. We want to see consistency. We want to see confidence that the government's going to follow through with what you said we're going to do. And how the internal swallows are are sort of out of you know, it's not like what you said. We'll, we'll take another question. Uh, right at the back, so Julian at the back. Thank you very much. I'm Julian at Hallowby Park. Thank you for your excellent. Speak up, Julian. Thank you for your excellent. Uh, Julian at Hallowby Park. Thank you for your excellent presentation so far. 
Um, can anyone on the panel be in any doubt asked today and the departure of Justin Weeding and uh, Charles, well, the move of Justin Weeding and the departure of Charles Hendry, that the, you know, moves towards a low carbon Britain have actually taken a, a bit of a big hit today and wasn't this signaled by George Osborne 10 months ago in this speech in the party conference, which more or less suggested that Britain can't afford to go fast on, climate, on dealing with climate change, as though we really had been going fast in the past. <laughs> Okay, that's kind of related to the last question. I'll let Alan have a, uh, a free hit. <laughs> well, um, um, the answer is yes. I, mean, uh, um, I, I think it is. You know, I, I, in a sense, as an opposition MP, you don't react in quite the same way as government coalition MPs do to reshuffles. Um, you sometimes react in an entirely inappropriate way when someone is um, grieving on the other side. Um, but I think that you know, it really is the case that there are several uh, real round, hole, round, round pegs in round holes who have inexplicably been moved. Um, quite often when there, there are absolutely central issues to be decided uh, which, which, for which those people uh, have a lot of competence and confidence. And I, I, really can't think of a better explanation for some of those than um, the, the, the idea that actually there is a shift away from uh, greener ministers in post towards less green ministers and I think that's that's serious and indeed um, we come back to the Treasury I mean I uh, the and, and back to my good old levy control mechanism um, joke I mean that is I think uh, almost a, a, a sign assure of what else is happening in as much as at the moment you have government departments moving on, on a greener direction being countermanded effectively by measures from Treasury uh, which render nugatory quite a lot of the things that are being done. The levy control mechanism is one very good example introduced without any sort of consultation or discussion. Um, uh, putting rather arbitrary caps on, on, on how levies can be used. And since levies were in the first instance designed uh, not to be public expenditure, defining as public expenditure and therefore capping them makes the whole idea of those levies. But how about does the, the Treasury have a responsibility to protect of course, individuals and consumers? Yes, abs absolutely, abs absolutely it does. What I'm saying, saying is, of course it does. Of course it does, but actually protecting the interest of consumers after a policy has been undertaken by undoing it is just not good governance, I'm afraid. And actually getting the policy right in the first place, I mean, I personally think that uh, 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 hypothecating green taxes for green investment and development will be a much better way of doing it than raising levies in the way that they're raised and then capping them so they don't work. But that is how the Treasury is working at the moment, and I'm afraid that's that seems to be increasingly a theme of government, that actually Treasury is stopping things happening in a way that quite often defies easy explanation and has to have a deeper agenda behind it. Okay, we're going to take another, take another question on it. Um, the, the chap in the blue shirt in the middle there, and then I'll come to Paul at the front. Next question. Hi there. Hi, it's Martin Grubb, Deutsche I just wanted to ask about the experience of other European countries in taking the lead on green issues. We got a fairly perilous financial situation for Bessas in, uh, in Denmark, uh, Gamesa, Silver World in Germany. I just wonder whether Denmark has really got the credit for going early in terms of wind, whether the Spanish economy has really benefited from a push of wind, and, and whether the re enormous resources in Silver in Germany has really created a sustainable green economy. Mm -hmm. Michael, would you like to Yeah. Sure. I mean, I, when I say that the this transformation is inevitable and the choice, the question is, do you lag or do you lead? And if you lead, by how much? I think in some of those cases, you can say that those countries have perhaps led by too much and also perhaps led in a far, rather foolish way. Um, because, uh, you know, people hold up the example of Germany with its feed-in tariffs as this tremendous, it is, it is simply seen as a success by those who want to see lots of solar. But very rarely does anybody ask the question whether it was a good and efficient use of uh, electricity uh, purchases money. 
Um, and you know, I would argue that one of the principles that we should be driving through this whole agenda is the principle of competition and price discovery and deregulation to make sure that we're not creating rents for industries. And what we've seen in Europe then is some of those rents blow up because in the case of Spain they become, you know, among other things, they become unaffordable. Um, well, I would also say that you know, you've chosen some examples of companies on the supply side of the industry. Right now, this industry is you know, it's, it, it's going through very tough times. Look at the valuations of, as you're well familiar with the, um, the valuations of clean energy companies uh, on the markets. They've all been hit. But there isn't the differentiation between the supply side, the technology providers, who are going through very difficult times of consolidation, uh, as you would expect in a young industry happening in automotive and other. Um, and then the people who own these projects who are actually doing rather well in a quiet way, uh, are not loved by the mainstream investors, but are actually uh, providing more yield, in many cases at lower risks, than equivalent, um, uh, uh, equivalent instruments. So I sort of, I back up and I'm not sure I agree with your premise, but I'm not sure I agree with part of your premise, but I agree with the other, the other part is that some of these countries have done things in a, in a very, uh, in, a, in a, a way we wouldn't want to copy, let's be generous. <laughs> Jeff, do you want to? Well, I can't comment on the European market, but I can uh, mention some of my experience from California where they, they've taken what I would kind of refer to as a modified feed-in tariff approach for renewables. And what happened, and I think this is an unintended consequence, is certain subsidized technologies had an advantage in that situation. And what you ended up with was the predominance of uh, solar and wind, which has led to too much intermittent sources feeding into the grid, which has kind of created another problem that now has to be addressed in some way. And I'm just kind of starting to get around that now. So that back to that concept of, you know, transparency and how things are developed, getting input from a broad range of sources to make sure these unintended consequences don't occur is, is pretty important. And you guys have an opportunity to kind of avoid some of those mistakes. Okay, um, I'm going to take a question from, uh, from right at the front here from Paul, and then we'll take uh, the, the one the Hi, thanks, Guy. <coughs> I'm Paul Eakins. Um, I'm director of the Institute for Sustainable Resources at University College London. And I'd like to pick up on a statement by uh, Alan uh, to the effect we might get a dash for gas as a default um, if EMR doesn't work. Um, and it relates very much to the lag or lead issues that Michael was talking about too. Because coming back to the Chancellor, he's actually talked about a gas strategy, uh, which implied that this was more of a, a default. This was actually an alternative. Everything I've done in the modeling of energy, which is quite a lot, tells me that you can't have investment in baseload gas now and meet our carbon targets. But we do need investment in gas capacity that will help us balance the grid towards the end of the 2020s. My question is a bit of a geeky question, I'm afraid, particularly to Alan and Laura is how can EMR help investors distinguish between investing in gas capacity that will have to be baseload for 10 years and then move to be back up if we are to have a low carbon Britain in 2030. And those gas investors who are hoping that they will get investment in unabated baseload gas through to 2045, which seems to be what the gas strategy has in mind. Well, yes, that's, a, that's a sort of a combination of a very large and, and I'm afraid to say a little geeky question, um, but I'm up to it, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Um, we'll see. <laughs> I'm not saying a successful geeky answer. Geeky answer. Um, yes, I mean, the, 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 I think there is a real danger, particularly with the combination of the grandfathering of, of, of gas and nuts by deck up to 2045, i.e. You can continue to run gas if you build it now at the present emission rates up to 2045 when we know that the overall emission level uh, for energy by the 2030s has to be what about an eighth, something like that, of the level that we're putting out now, about 100 grams or less compared with about five, 450, 500 at the moment. 
So grandfathering new gas blows a hole in that to start with. And if we then got a, 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 a dash for gas as a result of failure of other forms of investment as the cheapest and easiest and quickest way to actually get its capacity, then that will blow a further hole in it. So we can't do that over the next period if we are serious about meeting our climate change commitments and carbon budgets, which we've all signed up to. Um, but indeed, as Paul says, we have to have at least some gas on the system over the next period. And I think that back actually puts into question the one of the pillars of EMR, which is um, the capacity payment system, that clearly over the next period, you probably need some form of strategic reserve policy as far as gas is concerned, which actually was one of the ideas that was specifically thrown out at the time of the white paper. And EMR, we've actually got an industry-wide capacity payment arrangement. I think you would have to actually, uh, as I indicated in what I said, it introduced some changes in how the electricity market trading itself works in order to bring in a successful strategic reserve policy. Otherwise, you'd have the slippery slope problem of everybody wanting to bring the strategic reserve <coughs> and you'd be back to where you started from. But I think being able to have the ability to actually mothball and bring back into process existing gas plants and, if necessary, build gas plants in the future with a likely low running uh, arrangement as a strategic reserve. Uh, would be uh, the way forward. And what I would worry about is actually we would throw away what we are putting into capacity payments over the next period onto a lot of people who don't need it uh, and depriving ourselves of the resource to actually concentrate on those areas where we do need that backup in the future in the process. Laura. I mean, some, some of it I would agree with, 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 with Alan and others elements I would question. I mean, I think that we've got a situation where it is very, very difficult to look at sort of 25, 30 year investment profiles and also talk about a vibrant and quite changing sort of energy environment. And there will be pockets of not necessarily stranded assets, but possibly even stranded subsidies or stranded payments because it's not a perfect model and it's not going in a linear direction. Now, we talked about some of the capacity mechanisms in our um, response to um, EMR, and we've actually asked the department to come back to us with a lot more thinking behind it. So I think that there's an importance there. There is also an interesting response, and that is that if you go back sort of five, ten years, and you look at energy consumption, and you would say that energy consumption was predict predicted to increase by X percent. It's actually increased by quite a bit less than that because of the consumer, the actual behavior has changed. And while I think we must create a very, very sort of um, robust framework, we are going to find a lot of variables when we can't actually structure an energy market that goes to 2045 not taking into consideration behaviour change, not taking into consideration major innovations when to energy consumption. You look at the energy intensive um, industries, I mean, they are going to have to come up with some very different solutions for their um, production and manufacturing models. So I think we have got lots of problems, but we are trying to create quite a comprehensive set of policies. My problem is, is when the incentives start to uh, one layer on top of another, and that's when you start to get some financial issues and some gaming that goes with that. Okay. I think, if I may interject, I think it's going to be a crucial role for the ETS in, uh, in dealing, with, dealing with that issue. I'm going to take three questions at a time. Take the lady at the back, and then uh, Dustin and the person next to it. Thank you. Um, Catherine Harbour from EDM Strategic Consulting. It's been fascinating hearing your talks, and it, I felt there's a bit of a shopping list of all sorts of different things that could be um, that happen to deliver a low carbon economy. I'd like to ask each of the panelists what their top um, wish list or think most effective action that governments or businesses or the general population could do to deliver a low carbon economy. Okay, hold that thought because that'll be the last. Question. Uh, we'll take these two questions in this row here. Yeah, sorry. Hi, Dustin Benjamin from Green Alliance. Um, we've talked a bit about needing to be resource efficient. 
And I just wanted to uh, ask, what's the most, what's the biggest deficiency policy? Because it wasn't mentioned uh, in Michael's million of semi-failed policies, which is an idea I quite like. It's product standards, actually. Uh, fairly boring. Decided with the EU, it's about banning light bulbs and making your boiler more efficient and stuff like that. Uh, it's actually bigger than the Green Deal, Eco, and Smart Metering combined in terms of what it's supposed to say. In terms of what it's supposed to say. But it's mired in really messy EU politics. Um, and the, about half of the um, product standards haven't even got to the drawing board. The other half are, are delayed. So I guess my question is one about political risk, bearing in mind we need some stable, long-term uh, regulation to make this all work. And that's that if we've got a government that's divided on Europe, and we need a lot of you know, policy push to make these standards actually happen, you know, how do we actually get these savings? How can we make European standards, which are decided at a European level, quite unpopular, quite slow, to actually happen in the time frame we're expecting them to happen? Hi, I'm Jenny Banks from WWF. And we, the two suggestions have come through quite strongly from the, from the panel today. One of them was the need to be efficient in the way that we roll out clean energy, so not over-subsidising. Um, but another one was the need for investors to have long-term certainty. So it would be interesting to hear from the panel about how you feel we can best square the two. Quite the challenge. Um, I'll get to the most effective action government say we'll do that as the last run around, but um, perhaps, so um, Laura, do you want to come in on that, on that last question from, from Jenny? I mean, I think that in many ways what we need, and it was a little bit what happened with, um, with solar and, um, you know, in the select committee, strange enough, we asked the department, we asked DEC, long before there was the review on um, the solar feeding tariffs, are you actually, do you actually have milestones where you're looking at the technology and actually working out whether the technology's um, cost price has reduced to such an extent that actually the subsidy now of the feed and tariff is, is now no longer sustainable? And I, they, they sort of responded to us and sort of said, well, yes, we sort of, we do some level of prediction. Well, about, I suppose it was about three months later, then suddenly they, Changed the whole feed-in tariff, and there was this, you know, almighty row about how. No, not not actually. I mean, I don't. I, I totally supported the government and what they did. I think we had a bit of a problem about the process and and how it was actually implemented. What DEC have committed to us is that they are looking at reviewing on on a regular basis. And I think they learned a very very sort of painful lesson out of um, the, um, the the solar. Uh, feed and tariff um, review. They, we've certainly asked them to come back to us to ensure that they are getting, in many ways, that review process, the clarity in how and when they review from a technology investment point of view in place. Jeff, on that, on Jenny's question there, what, what is it fair for investors to expect in terms of certainty, and how much do you recognise that they're also going to be facing pressures? to do with governments not wanting to go far, not wanting to get into the situation that perhaps Germany and Spain have got to. Well, I'm, I'm never one to judge what's fair and what's not fair. What I'm, all I can say is companies are looking to make hundreds of millions of dollars in investments, and they're going to make those investments in locations where they have the most confidence and certainty that the investment's going to play out like it's been anticipated. So, I don't know how you bridge this gap, but by bridging the gap and creating that level of certainty, you get you increase your probability and chances of attracting investment. Yep. Michael, do you, want, do you want to come in on that as well? And also, if you could touch on that question about the kind of wider EU question yeah. related to product policy. Uh, uh, to be honest, I think the three questions are, are, are somewhat linked because I think that the answer to how do you manage, uh, how do you how do you navigate uh, the politics and how do you um, avoid the political risk is in a sense to demilitarize that discussion. Um, if any politician thinks that they're going to push this through by saying, well, you know, Europe is going to force us to do this, I think that's the wrong way to try it. Um, this has to make sense for this country and for the constituents of our MPs and others here. So rather than saying, well, we need to have building standards or product standards because the EU is going to force it. Uh, on us. 
Um, the explanation has to be made and the, the, the battle has to be won to explain why it is in the interest of Britain to move to a resource efficient economy. Uh, because very often the efficiency standards, um, Stephen Chu, Secretary of Energy in the US, has done a lot of research on this. The, initially the industry says, oh, you know, an efficient washing machine will cost more and it'll be awful. Lifetime costs of that washing machine, dramatically lower. And even the purchase price. By the time the industry gets together, they compete with each other, the appliance manufacturers, it is in the interests of this country's consumers to implement those, uh, th those standards. Same with building codes. 80% energy retrofits can be done. They can be done uh, uh, cost effectively. But that has to be that has to be taken to the consumer. It has to be explained why that's the only way to develop this economy so that we are not dependent on Russian uh, gas or Qatari gas or some hypothetical fines that I sincerely hope we have of shale gas in Poland or Ukraine, that well-known uh, highly democratic country that we want to become dependent <laughs> on now. You know, and, and that explanation, it's a, it is the sort of man or mouse moment. Are, you know, are we going to take that explanation to the consumers and explain it because then you don't have the political risks. So the narrative is one we're very familiar with in this country, which is that you take some sacrifice now, but you do it for a good and well understood reason, which has a payoff uh, in the measurable future, not some ridiculous 200 year thing, but, but in the future of ourselves and, and our children. Um, and I think that that, I want to come back, why that's linked to the question of um, certainty for investors is that we get too technocratic and there's too much sort of geekery and wonkery around EMR and the, and the ins and outs of policy reform. If you look at the countries that are really moving fast on this agenda, China, Germany, Korea, Denmark, they don't set one policy in place and then stick with it for 25 years or 30 years or the life of an asset. But what they do do, they do change and they digress, they feed in tariffs and they do all sorts of changes. What they do is they have an unswerving commitment to the direction of change in their economy. And that is also what business is looking for. Not necessarily, it's not, you know, obviously if you're promised a subsidy, that has to be honored. But that same subsidy doesn't have to be available in the future. In fact, we should make very strong statements about the time frames on which we're going to remove those subsidies. The correct response to 101 MP saying onshore wind shouldn't have subsidies, not, oh, but onshore wind's so important and we need a low carbon fuel. No, the correct response is absolutely. Absolutely, we should be working together to get rid of those subsidies as quickly as possible. Let's call it five years. Let's consult, let's talk to industry and make it absolutely clear what the direction of travel is so that the Siemens or the Korean uh, turbine manufacturers or whatever can have certainty what that trajectory is going to be. And, and, and I think it's all to do with, I say, it's, it's to do with that, with reframing the discussion around the inevitable shift in the economy. And once, you, once that is communicated, then all these other pieces will, will fall into, into place. And that's my top demand, Catherine, for what I would like to see is that sort of communication. It's not a piece of legislation, it's that sort of clarity of purpose and clarity of communication. It's my top, my top Christmas list wish. Alan, what's your top Christmas list wish? <laughs> Um, Related to energy, probably. <laughs> 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 it may be the same. I don't know. Yeah. It's about to bring Santa's secret wishes <laughs> <laughs> out. Um, I, I think I'll just preface that by saying I mean, I can't resist saying that actually the idea of the renewables obligation is precisely that is not to have a permanent subsidy, never was to have a permanent subsidy, was to digress. But the idea of, 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 of an RO is it continues to face in the same direction and enables that um, certainty of investment over a period of time to take place. And that's where we've been particularly bad in this country, I think, compared with some other European countries who have not necessarily stuck with a, I mean, there's been a long history of, uh, across the world, indeed, of having ludicrous subsidies um, for various forms of energy over the years, which bear no relation to their actual intrinsic merit the economy, but actually this is not an intrinsic subsidy, it's a digressing subsidy, but you need certainty ahead of it. And I, for one, really think that the idea that, as I said, halfway through um, a major deployment of offshore wind, which will you know, continue to secure our world leadership in, in, in offshore and put an infrastructure in place which actually will serve us very well for a very number of years, 
halfway through that deployment, we pull the plug on the certainty of what form of investments to take place. And people are looking at whether they rush forward with the RO before 2017 and maybe get a smaller investment or hope they're going to get some CFDs at a later date. Nobody knows what they're doing. And, and I think that's, that's a, a real underlining point about you know, governments actually tend to believe that they can change the wheels on a moving car whilst keeping it moving along the road. And you can't. You actually, the imperative is to keep the vehicle moving and work out what you're doing with that in mind. And <coughs> that certainty, I think, is, is, is something you've not been, not been good at. As far as my wish is concerned, I, 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 I think, um, I, almost, I almost want to say that this boilers, um, actually one of, the, one of the most efficient and effective climate change active devices was simply changing the building regulations so that you had low, um, low, low uh, emission condensing boilers in the country uh, and those came into place over about three years, 15% uh, uh, condensing boilers, two years before there were about 70-80% to 80 condensing boilers in the country. And developing building regulations so that we have energy efficient homes um, and providing the resources to make those homes energy efficient would probably be the biggest thing we could do in terms of um, low carbon economy and sustainable low carbon economy over the next 20, 30 years. Jeff, quickly, if you can, the, what, the one thing that you would like? Well, since these guys covered the certainty so well, I'm going to say simple. <laughs> Laura? And I sort of go back in many ways to what Michael was saying. I think that we need to engage the consumer. And it's, at the moment, this is very much a push issue. The consumer needs to pull in as well. And I think that you know that's very much dependent on the sector really engaging with people, and particularly as cost is such an issue. If you can start revealing in an innovative way that you're reducing people's overall costs, I think it will be extremely important. And that will persuade politicians beyond a question of doubt. Okay, uh, I'm going to have to stop there. Sorry, I know there were extra questions. Um, I'd like to say thank you to FRX for supporting tonight's event. Thank you all for coming. To next time discussion, I'd like to thank the panel for, for...